There was no internet at the time. I can't hear somebody else. Just slap me if I fucking say that again. And what the... <laughs> You've got to remember there was no internet at the time. Oh, we had to do everything without the internet. Oh, no mobile phones. For as far back as most of us can remember, British culture has been defined by its youth tribes. From mods to skins, suede heads to punks, soul boys, ravers, grungers, garage heads and emo kids. The UK has been the breeding ground for young people trying to look fresh under pressure. So what do you want to talk about? These youth cults, born and bred on the streets of Britain and often taken onto a world stage, have come about through a journey of innovation, of experimentation, of disillusionment, fear, love and occasionally violence. We're going to tell the story of that journey, of how through clothes and music, original kids from Coventry, Camden and Croxteth helped Britain change the fashion habits of entire generations and develop the UK into the cradle of youth culture it is today. I seen a greaser the other day. I asked him his name, he said go away. So I kicked him in the bollocks and I kicked him in the head. Cos I am a tasty skinhead. 15, I took that. 16, I took that. That's me and my first magic mushrooms. Me and my mate Simon, just we were 15 then. Me just loving my mates and the scene and the music and feeling a part of something. I obviously was doing more than just photographing my mates. It blows my fucking mind that I was taking this shit at 15 years of age. And then all of a sudden the hipsters get hold of it like Vice and I'm a fucking god. I'm a hipster god. I can float through Shoreditch and get flowers thrown at me. Look at the television and madness is on. I don't know why, or any other 14, 15 year old, or well, you guys will never know why you put something grabbed your bollocks when you were 14 and that was it. You knew you were going to die with your mates, you were going to listen to this music forever. The guys that were playing this music were fucking your heroes. What makes me any different? I saw madness and I thought, that's us, that's us, that is us. So of course we went to school the next day and go, did you fucking see those guys on television? What are they, mods, punks? American, because we had to wait for Smash Hits to come out, or we had to find, they had to, there was no way of getting any information, which is sad now, really. You can't do that, because there's the internet now. And then you found out Madness were part of the two tone scene and named after Prince Buster, and then they were basically skinheads. So I became a skinhead. If there'd have been a mod, I would have been a mod. But it somehow spoke to me. And it was as if all those years of feeling extremely shy and delicate just seemed to end more or less overnight. Not unlike the mod revivalists, skinheads returned relatively soon after their initial incarnation in the mid-1960s. Skinheads had always worn their working class identity with pride, and the return of the skinhead in the 80s amplified this pride to a deafening level. Searching for an original Brutus shirt in the early 80s was a full-time occupation for a skin. It was a case of trawling through second-hand shops for the most authentic garments, as the first generation skins dropped off their discarded jeans and shirts to the local Salvation Army shop. That's when I first turned skinhead and I wasn't really getting the look right. I looked a bit crap there, didn't I? The thing with being a mod for me was a bit weird because I was a real tomboy and I didn't really want to wear these little skirts and twin sets which a lot of the girls wore. In between I was thinking I really like that skinhead look. You know, tonic suits and loafers and amazing Ben Shermans and Brutus and JTEX. So that really appealed to me. There we go, Fred and Jail. Ben Sherman from sort of 69, absolutely perfect. Nice little candy stripe. I've got quite a few nice shirts. This one's my favourite. I love big collars and bright colours. One of my favourite suits, just because that cloth, it's just superb. These are original 69 monkey boots, popular with the girls because they couldn't get DM small enough. So that's really loud. Um, I've not had balls big enough to wear one yet. <laughs> I'll show you my socks, like, all 60s socks. You can't wear original clothes and not have original socks, can you? I got into soul music from my dad at about 16, and then I took it a little bit further, delving into it and getting passionate. Then I progressed and thought, I want to be skinhead. So I just really, really took it to a different level, just passionate, and maybe a bit crackers, as you can see with my house. In the 1980s, many working class kids came from families with a keen political awareness, 
Socialism and unions were an absolute reality for people raised for the production line. The youth were politicised, but not necessarily represented. In the absence of a real voice, some relied on the voice of resentment found on the far right. A crude comic book interpretation of politics was afforded from groups such as the British Movement and the National Front. Are you political? We're a national, national front. front. We're all national front. You're all national front. Why? Majority, majority. We're like niggas. They don't belong here. Students! 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 There is something about Wickham. It did have a very strong gang contingent compared with other towns. It was only 35, 34 miles away from London, but it might as well have been on the fucking moon. And if you're going to get the whole 50s social engineering of just going, let's dump a load of fucking war traumatised people, Irish immigrants, West Indian immigrants, into these fucking towns, and let's just leave them there. And then they're tearing lumps out of each other, and they're getting politicised by the time they're 14, 15. There was an energy that attracted us from the extreme, a lot of kids from grew up in children's homes. It blossomed like mushrooms, and there was only negative press. All those fucking journalists must have just fanked each other off, and you yeah, skinheads, yeah. So you're sitting there with all your friends, and you're in this incredibly vibrant culture, the black and white kids coming together for the first time. And then we get, it's getting demonized for Nazism, which is just fucking fantastic. You know, the thing about being a skinhead was, Everyone was a wanker. The Nazis, the left, we all of them. I went to a Desmond Decker concert and he came on stage and suddenly this group of dodgy skinheads started zeke-hiling. I remember just feeling ashamed that if anyone looked at me and thought, she's a skinhead, she's into that, I was like, I'm not doing this. You got all these people with this kind of NF attitude. It just spoiled it. <laughs> Skinheads fell into a negative caricature of themselves. The increasingly fractured, mod revivalists and the two-tone rude boys converged into one amorphous youth tribe, the Scooter Boys. I'm a Scooter lad, right? And I belong in Scooter land. But what united them was a fascination for the Italian scooters now gathering rust in the sheds of pensions. They were available on the cheap, and they offered a new autonomy and independence to a generation that felt hemmed in. Soon, scooter runs started popping up around the country, offering acceptance to kids that wouldn't have been seen or heard at Glastonbury. This is a uh, LI Lambretta 150 Special. People say they're unreliable, but they were, they've always been unreliable. That's the fun of having a Lambretta. I mean, these were just a cheap form of transport, but with the Italians, the way they style and design everything, it, it just become an icon. When the Northern Mod come out, they were sort of a mixture of the mods the skinheads, everything, and we just loved it. Jean jackets, Dr. Martins. We wanted in, thinking, hang on, we can ride scooters and not look like mods. And that's where the scooter boy sort of evolved. For me, I think it, it was a way out. You, you know, when you come from a working class family, just getting away from your mum and dad, you know, constantly arguing. Every rally was like a party. <laughs> for Isle of Wight. You're talking over 20,000 scooters then. This was before a lot of the big festivals. You would just look on the top of the hill and it looked like Glastonbury, basically. It was the nearest you'll ever get to freedom of doing exactly what you like. On a Saturday on a bank holiday, it's quite common to see really hundreds of scooters. It's an amazing thing to see, an amazing smell, amazing noise. Of course, you sort of brought feeling a bit trapped. So they've seen these kids given this kind of first sense of freedom. It's incredibly romantic. That idea was kind of made more romantic by the names of the scooter clubs. So you've got like, things like Donny Hunters, Engoli was a Ghoul Gladiators, the Scunthorpe Road Rats, a lot of kind of uh, very heroic names, you know, or some sort of freedom. Even though everything broke down every 10 miles, they want that free. Now it's gone. The scooters I always love were Lambrettas. The ones I still love the most now, they, these kind of sort of homemade custom scooters, really. It was all about trying to make them go faster and failing terribly, you know. We just did lots of videos in sheds and garages and grinders and made his dad's hammer trying to make something that had been engineered beautifully and worked perfectly well. Go eight miles an hour faster than just ruining it. Do you see what they've got in the pay place in the south? They reckon that we've made the uh, 
Isle of Wight into the Isle of Frye. He got to this point where bad manners seemed to be playing at every rally. I went to a rally and there was a Vespa tug of war on a piece of grass. You think, that's really not why I'm going to scooters, you know, <laughs> to watch two fat fellas pissed doing a Vespa tug of war. It definitely changed. That was its downfall because everybody was welcome. It brought a lot of the wrong people in and you had sort of the right wing start to get in now. Kids just were lost. People blame the blacks like they blame the Polish now. It was any excuse, but we were listening to black music. We were dancing to Scar. You know, you're contradicting yourself. I think they were just rebelling for the sake of rebelling. For people like me and a lot of people who have been in it since 1980, we're still doing exactly what we did in them days. We're still drinking and partying and thinking we're 19 years old. I've noticed even the two-tone and the scar scene now getting very big, the skinhead scene getting big. The scooter scene is now the biggest it's ever been. Mm. You know, it's got more commercial, but it's good for me. I work on them, so... You know, I'm not going to turn anybody's money down, do you know what I mean? Being rude was a sense of style, but a sense of attitude. It's looking as best as you possibly can with whatever you've possibly got.